Good morning. My name is Katie Hirsch, and I'm a curator at the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art at the College of Charleston. Thank you for joining us for the first of several in conversation events that we'll host over the rest of the year for a new virtual exhibition, Displacements Revisitations of Home. Displacements opened on Friday, August 28th, and may be experienced at displacements.org. Displacements Revisitations of Home features the work of 10 artists who were asked to submit work that speaks most closely to their own reflections on the idea of home. Each artist was paired with a writer who responded to the body of work with an essay. Recordings of all conversation events, including this one, will be available at displacements.org after the fact. We also invite you to participate in the project by visiting the Engage tab on the website. There, you'll find a phone number you can call to leave a message sharing your own stories of home, as well as a map where you can add your home alongside those of others. Today, I'm pleased to introduce displacement artist Yaakov Israel and his respondent, Dr. Mark Long. Yaakov Israel is an Israeli photographer who lives and works in Jerusalem, where he's kindly joining us from this today. Yaakov focuses on long-term photography projects that investigate Israeli identity. Mark Long is a political geographer who is professor of political science at the College of Charleston, as well as curator at large and academic liaison at the Halsey Institute. Mark and Yaakov have worked on several projects together, including an essay Mark wrote to accompany Yaakov's exhibition, the Quest for the Man on the White Donkey at the Halsey Institute in 2014. Today, Mark and Yaakov will engage in a conversation about their work for the Displacements Project. Afterwards, I invite you to leave any questions you have for the pair in the comments below on the Facebook event. Um, good morning, Yaakov and Mark. Thanks for being here. Good morning. I'm going to um, start by bringing up Yaakov's exhibition page on displacements.org and I'll hand it over to you two. Good morning Katie, good morning everybody um, and thanks for the introduction um, and good morning in particular I guess to you Yakov. Um, we've been talking about this project for well a, a long time for years at this point that's for sure um, and I thought we'd get started really by um, having you introduce Southwest Jerusalem uh, to the audience here, uh, thinking about the kind of genesis and uh, the development of the project. Okay, good morning, uh, Mark, and good morning, everybody. Um, Southwest Jerusalem project uh, is uh, it's a photography project that I started uh, in my fourth year of studies uh, in the photography department in Bezalel, um, and it uh, met it became my graduation show and uh, after I graduated I carried on working on this project uh, throughout the years. Um, it's a project uh, that uh, deals with the neighbors of Southwest Jerusalem, specifically with uh, Kiryat Yovel, Kiryat Menachem and Katamonim, which are the sort of traditional working class uh, neighborhoods of Jerusalem. And I grew up in Kiryat Yovel, and I still live here today. And um, it, uh, it sort of, uh, it brings together um, a lot of uh, interests that I have in, uh, in cities uh, and the idea of how you live in these places and, uh, and also the way you sort of navigate uh, the urban space. And uh, these, these are three neighborhoods that I, I think of them as uh, basically neighborhoods that uh, the people that live there are the people that maintain the city. And, um, but uh, the places, uh, these, these types of places are usually sort of transparent uh, to most others. Uh, they're not on the tourist itinerary and, uh, and uh, a lot of people, well, they sort of know their names, but uh, maybe have never been here. I see there's an interesting uh, sun, uh, <laughs> happening over my face at this moment. And um, so that's it basically. It started uh, 19 years ago and carried on till today. And uh, lately we've uh, exhibited it and uh, we've done other things with it. And we'll talk more about that uh, as time goes on. Uh, 
doing this talk. Mark, just a Great. second, I'm gonna close the window just a touch. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, that's that wonderful Mediterranean sunlight creeping in, of course, there, and uh, you know certainly that's a that that's part of your work in general. Let's say that um, that that magnificence that one encounters in the landscape there. Um, but tell us a little bit more, Yakov. So this is a long-term project. Um, you know, I know that in displacements we have images that run from 2002 all the way through to a 2020 um, image, if memory serves, and so that's kind of the span of the project in that sense. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about the fact that this is such a, a, a long endeavor. You know, I think it begins, as you suggested, with that uh, senior thesis, and then really it, it becomes an homage, in my reading at least, uh, to this particular place, right? And in many regards, then we're really talking about an homage to home, because as you say, this is where you grew up and this is where you live still. Um, what about that long range of uh, your engagement with Southwest Jerusalem? Well. I think in a way it uh, it start well I don't know if homage is the way I'd put it but uh, but it did start as um, from the beginning as uh, as looking at this place you know that uh, that's a very it's a complex uh, place to live in because uh, these apartment blocks that were built here in the 50s and 60s to accommodate uh, all the people that uh, arrived uh, in in Israel at the time arrived in the new state that was established and there was you know there were, uh, the state needed uh, to take care of uh, uh, of housing for all these new immigrants, and uh, so these apartment blocks were built uh, very quickly and um, uh, without really thinking about um, you know long term uh, housing solutions. It was more like a short term housing solution, uh, housing solutions, but uh, but they survived and uh, carried on. And when I say complex, I mean, you know, the apartments uh, were very small from, let's say, 36 meters to a two room apartment, square meters, and uh, to the larger ones were around 47 meters. Uh, and um, so there's a lot of complexities in living in such small spaces, uh, especially that a lot of the families had quite a few children and uh, and it was complicated. Um, and um, but parallel to the complications, there was um, something quite magical about uh, about growing up in these places at the time. You know, I grew up in the eighties, and uh, it had a certain sort of vibe to it that uh, uh, that in retrospect, uh, I th you know, and when thinking about how I'm raising my my child today, you know, in the uh, it has a certain charm for sure. Um, and um, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I carried on taking the pictures um, with, with, without really thinking, you know, of, uh, of defining a time when this project would end, uh, you know, or it was just something I did um, throughout life, in a way, you know, it, uh, um, occasionally I noticed something within one of these neighborhoods uh, I walk a lot and uh, and that's you know it's also just something I do but it's also something that uh, helps uh, find all these places that uh, maybe I would forget about you know or not uh, not have noticed at all and uh, so during my daily walks I've sort of noticed uh, sometimes people sometimes places and um, and then uh, on occasion I return and photograph them uh, with the people very quickly I understood, or maybe I should expand a bit about the project itself. The project uh, is built out of uh, three uh, categories. One, the first one is uh, portraits of the building, usually from uh, one of the sides or the, the back of the building, uh, not the facade. Uh, the second part is portraits of uh, the, the residents of these neighborhoods. And the third is, uh, is sort of uh, views uh, that are more topographic um, by definition, uh, that show the layout of the land, the way the buildings and the streets sort of work together to get a sort of uh, more topographic idea of, of how these places look. Uh, and uh, with uh, the people very quickly, I understood that, um, that it needs to be spontaneous. It's, uh, you know, so with the people, it's when I go out to take pictures, if I come by somebody that, uh, that's interesting, 
uh, and we start the conversation, then sometimes it might end uh, with him posing for a portrait. Uh, with the buildings, usually I'm sort of trying to make mental notes of uh, specific ones that catch my attention and, uh, and so on. And the topographic views also the same sort of method. So this all came together uh, basically, you know, throughout life, you know, just walking here, walking there, you know, going to buy groceries and, uh, and coming back uh, via public transportation uh, or whatever. And slowly it started to accumulate and um, I exhibited the work on occasion, uh, especially in the, you know, the first years uh, after I graduated. And, uh, but simultaneously I was working on quite a few projects because the way I work, it's not only on one project, you know, in depth, it's, uh, it's, it's about usually six or seven projects. Right. And then uh, on, you know, by all kinds of things that happen uh, and things that are occupying my mind at that moment, then I work more on one specific one uh, in comparison to the rest. Uh, but they all sort of fit under a large umbrella of uh, social and political interests. Uh, this one's certainly the most personal because it is home and uh, um, and it has that aspect to it. But uh, in a way, all the things I do uh, are related to my homeland. And uh, And when I say political and social, I mean, it's not like slogans. It's more the way these things uh, manifest in my daily life and and uh, and actually shape my life here. Uh, so, so that's that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it is a very in intensely personal project. Um, one of the things that strikes me in in the work, and I think in 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 our conversations uh, about this over the course of certainly um, twenty twenty has been a, a big push in terms of uh, this particular project is ways in which it's both personal and also very universal. Um, and of course it's personal because this is the place you've lived in, but um, you know, when you talk and we've talked at length about this, and I know we'll get to talk about a, a recent iteration, if you will, along with displacements of Southwest Jerusalem um, just last week in the, in the downtown in Jerusalem. Um, but in uh, uh, conversation about this particular project, you know, there's a lot of really interesting vignettes that shine through that are paralleled by my own experience. So we grew up in very similar places in terms of the kinds of neighborhoods, right? Um, I grew up in Ireland, of course, and you're in uh, Jerusalem. We grew up at a very similar time too, right? Because we're sort of of an age. And so when you talk about watching videos, for example, when they uh, first appeared on the scene, as it were, in cable over the course of the 1980s in Jerusalem, that was also the case in Cork uh, over the course of the self same time frame. Um, and likewise, um, when you know you reflect on the experience of of inhabiting this place and people going on holidays, uh, on vacation with other families. Uh, these were kind of part and parcel of the experience, likewise, of, of growing up in working class uh, Ireland. And really, I wanted for us to think a little bit or have you reflect on that logic of um, just how this is a very working class neighborhood and how this is the Jerusalem, I think you mentioned already, that, that isn't seen on um, tourist guides that isn't part of an itinerary of people traveling through this space. So when you think about this as your home place and you think in particular about um, being in this place and reflecting on this place through that lens of this as a working class neighborhood, um, how does how does that, uh, why is it important, I guess is really what I'm saying here, Yakov, for your work to capture that part of Jerusalem, right? This um, part of the city that isn't typically celebrated uh, and the people that inhabit that particular space likewise? Well, we've spoken about this, uh, I guess, many times uh, in all kinds of sort of shapes and uh, ways. But uh, basically, I'm, as you well know, I'm a big believer in biography. And uh, I think that uh, at the end, um, a lot of uh, the interests that we have uh, were shaped way back, you know, way before we even thought uh, uh, of who we're going to, you know, what we're going to do and who we're going to be. And, um, and I think that uh, growing up in a, in a neighborhood like this, uh, uh, you know, with uh, people around me from really many, many countries, you know, the neighborhoods of Southwest Jerusalem were populated by, uh, at the time, by people that, uh, that immigrated to Israel from North Africa, from uh, Iran, Iraq, 
uh, Syria. Uh, and, um, you know, and my family came from Africa also, but uh, from South Africa and uh, from Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. And uh, it was like, um, it, it was, it was part of this huge uh, idea of the state. Uh, they called it the melting pot uh, idea to, to sort of connect uh, people to each other and to see how, you know, to try and make uh, one uh, so-called one, one, one person or one type of people. So in my English, maybe it's glitched there. Yeah. Uh, one type of, you know, uh, of Israeli, the new Israeli, that's a combination of somehow everything. Uh, of all the people that came here, so uh, so th that experiment, of course, uh, didn't really work. But uh, but for me as a kid, you know, I did get to know a lot of other cultures, and a lot of uh, I think uh, people that uh, and you know professions that maybe I wouldn't have come into such close proximity if I would have been living in other places. Uh, you know, families. Uh, of two and three children in comparison to families of uh, seven and eight children, you know, so uh, people that worked in all kinds of uh, professions that uh, I really, you know, I, th I think uh, at the time I didn't pay much attention, but I, but in retrospect, I noticed that, uh, that I really did notice everything that was happening around me and the way it was affecting these people's lives. And, uh, and I think this, uh, this sort of led to to the, this idea that um, uh, that these places, uh, even though they're not like the official sites, uh, you know, people live their lives here, and um, and uh, their lives are just as rich and complicated uh, as <laughs> other lives in other places. But uh, but this somehow sort of caught my attention early on, maybe even as a student. Uh, and this sort of pushed me to to think, you know, of how how do I look at this place, you know, uh, from one point of view with a bit of criticism, because you know I know the complexities uh, from a personal point of view, and then uh, from you know from the other side, uh, you know, of of how how life was at that time there. Uh, so I think this is what sort of really got me going. With time, also things started changing, uh, you know, gentrification started hitting in. Uh, even before that, uh, you know, there was a big immigration from, uh, 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 from Russia and then from Ethiopia. Uh, and, you know, the, the old uh, or sort of, you know, the original residents uh, started moving on. Uh, a lot of them moved on and, uh, and new ones took their places. Uh, so in a way in the, you know, in the, the years I've been living here, uh, I've seen uh, also how the populations have shifted. And now lately, you know, the municipality of Jerusalem has decided to, to sort of break down a lot of these uh, apartment blocks and build uh, uh, skyscrapers just to sort of cram more people into this area of the city because there's a huge uh, uh, problem of, uh, you know, people don't, there's not enough apartments in Jerusalem to accommodate all the people living here. Um, and the natural growth of the city, uh, and um, and this has begun to take place. So, I've, you know, but before that, we've already seen um, types of people that have moved into this neighborhood that uh, that uh, ten years ago you would never see here. So this was something else that sort of well, this is like expanding on your question um, that sort of got me also thinking of uh, of that it would be a good time to really try and finalize this body of work because soon the whole place is going to look different from the architecture to the types of people living here. Uh, so, so that, the, you know, the exhibition now in the Halsey and uh, what we've been doing, the exhibition in Jerusalem uh, and, uh, and all the rest of, are part of sort of summing up the, the project in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, that there's a moment in time, right, which is 
that second half of the 20th century, obviously, and all the change within this neighborhood that, in a certain sense, needs to be documented. And uh, to that end, Katie, maybe we could look at just a few of the photographs on the Displacements website um, and have you, Yakov, um, tell us a little bit about images such as these. And so we might start, indeed, with that logic of documentation. And maybe that first image here, which is an image on Columbia Street, I know, um, tell us about that image, and in particular from the perspective here of the changing architecture, right? So here's uh, one of these uh, older buildings within the neighborhood. Uh, most, of the, most of the buildings um, are from the same period of time, from the late 50s and uh, the beginning of the 60s. Uh, but um, the people that were living in these places tried to sort of make them more livable because the apartments are very small. So we can see a lot of sort of changes on the, you know, this uh, room that was built outside on the bottom floor. Um, uh, one of the things I like a lot about the, that this image and also made me photograph it was uh, this sort of uh, barred window that ceases to exist at this point, where, you know, on the top right hand side of the image. Uh, and this, these small sort of uh, clues to human existence uh, are always interesting for me, you know, because uh, the people that are living here, they, they're not really thinking about how this looks from the outside. And we can talk also about that, uh, but more of how to make the, you know, the inside of the apartments uh, more livable. And uh, so a lot of the time, the sort of external uh, um, clues to what was there before, they just remain in place. They, they, you know, they're just there. Uh, so this is also one of those. Uh, images that sort of made me really look at the at this sort of side of the building and how how far it, it uh, sort of uh, went from the original building also on the left we can see another part of the building which is also a, a new part of the building it doesn't look new it's very moldy and uh, dilapidated but uh, everything that's on the left uh, is basically uh, another room that was built uh, you know on the side of the building for the three apartments that are, you know, from bottom to top. Um, and this building was uh, in front of a, a building where I was living in previously for the for 12 years. And, um, and in general, uh, a lot of the, the buildings that I'm showing in the, this series are buildings that, uh, that have gone through small, or larger transformations throughout the years. Very personal transformations. A lot of them are uh, uh, labeled as illegal uh, as far as uh, the municipality goes. Uh, but um, I think that uh, uh, that's what makes them very personal also. And also gives us a sort of small insight towards what the people live in there, you know, a bit of how they're feeling throughout uh, these small changes. Right. Um, and I think this is a good image, too, to dwell on this logic of obviously there are um, personal stories to be told here. There are, if you will, local stories, right? And so very much these working class neighborhoods are about the um, the experience in Israel over the course of the decades after World War II. But there are also clearly universal stories to be told here in the sense that um, the ongoing urbanization, not just within Israel, but worldwide, of course, means that there's a great push to put in place housing, both in Israel, so to in Ireland, but right the way across the world over the course of the self-same decades, right? And so we get a lot of very functional buildings put in place, and we get a lot of um, people uh, modifying their uh, environment, of course, to gain more space, which is one of the things that we're clearly seeing in this image. Um, Katie, would you mind scrolling through maybe uh, five or six more images? And I want for us to, um, uh, to look at a, an image that's on Hanurit Street. So um, it's that purple one. I think it's next. Um, tell us a little bit about this image as well, Yakov, and in particular here, um, for folks that haven't had a chance maybe to explore these images on the website, um, let me just point out a very interesting architectural feature here, um, which is this walkway that we see um, across the, uh, as I look at it, the right-hand side of the image. Tell us about this uh, particular place that as representative, if you will, of buildings within this part of Israel, and it's very different in terms of scale from the one we were just looking at. Um, what does what, what tell us about this image, this uh, this this street scene, as it were, from Jerusalem? So uh, this type of apartment block is also very common in uh, in uh, 
in Kiryat Yovel and Kiryat Menachem, which are uh, like very hilly neighborhoods. And, um, and because uh, uh, these buildings were situated on the sides of, uh, you know, the, of a mountain, well, a mountain's a big word, a hill, uh, then um, uh, they had to find a sort of way to, to let people enter the building uh, in the middle to, you know, and not at the ground floor, because if they were entering the ground floor, they'd be climbing up eight or nine uh, or 10 uh, flights of stairs. So uh, these are uh, sort of bridges that sort of lead to the, into the sort of uh, uh, foyer <laughs> of the building. Um, so they were situated from, you know, street level into the middle of the building. The building carries on like four or five uh, flats down and four or five uh, flats up. Uh, this one was sort of painted in a way um, well, this was taken, I think, in 2007, and it, it looked like it was painted relatively close to the time I was, I took the image. Uh, and uh, so architecturally speaking, these are very common in these neighborhoods. And this uh, architectural solution is also very common. Um, and this, uh, let's say, is basically the facade of the building, but as you can see, it's not much of a facade. It's uh, a very functional one. Um, and um, um, I remember when we started to talk, you, you found these bridges uh, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did. You know, partly, of course, it's because they're, they're a reflection of this particular place, right? So this is the topography of the city, as you point out. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm lucky enough to have visited with you in Jerusalem, and, um, and I'm sure lots of the people that are watching, likewise, will have been to that particular part of the world, or if they've not, I'm sure they'll be more inclined to go for looking at these images. But the point about Jerusalem, as you point out, is that, yeah, they're not mountains, but some of those hills are um, steep enough to almost qualify, right? And so I think that um, the, the buildings and, and the work, of course, is a reflection of uh, the need to fit these new structures into the topography was interesting to me. And then again, you know, I mean, the personal connections are always important. I've spent a lot of time in northern Spain, likewise, which is also a very hilly part um, uh, of that particular country. And you see these kinds of architectural um, features, as it were, in that place, likewise. So I think that's one of the reasons that, um, that uh, this image and the images like this resonated. Katie, would you click on to the next image, which is a Hanka um, street image. And I'd like to have you talk about this too, Yakov. Um, you know, I, I think in many senses about the body of work as being very much about dignifying these particular places. Um, you know, you take these images in uh, very specific ways, you use very specific tools to do it. And in many senses, what you're doing is you're um, taking photographs of these working class neighborhoods as though they were very celebrated um, uh, buildings of renown, as it were. Um, this is a fascinating image, uh, one that I'm very interested in, in part, because it's so revealing of another dimension to your work, which is the more technical matters. And so for folks that haven't been lucky enough um, to look at this particular image on um, a high res version of it, you know, you can look into the apartments here precisely because of the way um, you go about the work, Yakov. And so the, the most clearly illuminated of the apartments here that's visible, um, you can see the clock on the wall behind somebody watching television that underlines this is a photograph that was taken at 5 p.m. Um, a one day in the fall, if memory serves, of 2007, 2008. And so I'd like to have you reflect on um, and tell us a little bit about the working method here in terms of the large format camera that you use, because I think it's intrinsic to this project in terms of this um, celebration in a certain sense. I know you don't particularly care for the word homage, right? But the dignification of this particular uh, space that takes place through the work um, is a very important dimension to Southwest Jerusalem too. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I use uh, mainly an eight by 10 inch camera uh, and sometimes also four by five. Uh, these are, it's a technical camera with bellows. It's uh, um, highly unpopular nowadays. And uh, the reason I use this camera, well, there's many reasons for using this ca these cameras. Uh, the the w first, you know, the one that's most obvious is that when uh, when we print uh, for exhibitions and uh, uh, then the images uh, have this hyper realistic quality, especially with the eight by 10, because the eight by 10 has this sort of uh, 
um, it's hyper realistic. It pro produces an image that's hyper realistic, which means that it's sharper than what the eye can see, and um, and that allows uh, me to create to to print images uh, that um, hopefully allow the viewer to sort of uh, for 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 a few seconds forget he's looking, you know, at the, at the, at the photograph and and really sort of fall into the image itself. Uh, so that's, you know, the obvious reason for using it. Uh, this other reason, which is for me much more important, is the fact that once I'm out there photographing, there's a, uh, it's like a sort of photographic, something's happening, it's an happening. And, um, you know, I'm with the tripod, the camera's on the tripod, uh, the whole apparatus, uh, in, you know, it, uh, people notice it. And uh, usually in three or four minutes uh, from when I put the camera up, uh, usually a few people from the building itself have noticed that I'm photographing the building and come out uh, to see exactly what's going on. And uh, I love this, uh, you know, this uh, way of working because uh, uh, it, uh, it makes, I think of myself more as uh, collaborating and using photography uh, you know, to create a certain, uh, to, to really allow myself to, to start talking to people, you know, because once you walk down the street and you just start talking to somebody, uh, mostly he'll just look at you and sort of say, what's this weird guy want from me and carry on, you know. But once you're out there with the camera uh, and uh, a camera that, you know, not a small one that uh, nowadays everybody, nearly everybody uses, owns and uses, and nobody will really give you the time of day for if you sort of ask them to, you know, to stop for a portrait or something with a small camera. It's a completely different way of interacting with the, with your with your surroundings. But with this, uh, I think of myself a bit like a spider, and I'm sort of you know creating a web, and then uh, you know the people are sort of coming into it, and then uh, once they're there, they start you know asking me, and this is one of the questions I've been asked over the years, again and again, is what's interesting with uh, you know why is this building interesting and um and i look at them and i can see that uh, they've this might be the first time they're really looking at the building that they've been living in for decades sometimes you know and um and then we usually start a conversation um uh, you know which uh, mo most often leads to n nothing concrete but occasionally you know if uh, if the person uh, sort of, I find him interesting, then we might also do a portrait of him. Uh, and this, the whole way of working like this uh, uh, has been something that I've been doing, you know, for nearly 20 years now. And uh, it's a, I've, I've noticed that people are really, you know, interested in, in the, the reasons of me doing this. this for a lot of the people living there, this uh, doesn't really make sense. And you said that uh, that I'm, you know, in a way, I'm. This series dignifies these places and these people. And this is another thing that I think uh, is important because uh, I find that, you know, um, I like the idea that I'm using like a super um, unique tool that maybe, you know, in other places, maybe in the states, uh, people, some photographers still use it to photograph celebrities, politicians, you know. Uh, uh, people of importance, let's say, and uh, and I like the idea of using, you know, the, maybe the one of the most expensive tools in photography to use uh, uh, to document, you know, working class people, and this is uh, in a way it's uh, it's nearly activistic. I don't know how to say this word in Hebrew, in English, sorry, uh, right. but uh, it has this sort of uh, um, agenda also to it, you know, to you know to you. It's uh, anyway, but uh, going back to the you know the people standing next to me, and I'm sort of just you know taking my head out of the black cloth, and uh, and I see two or three or four people or more standing around me, looking at the building, you know, and this sort of um, slowly started to to sink in, and um, and I started thinking about you know uh, people that the fact. I started thinking about the fact that a lot of the people that are living in these neighborhoods uh, are, aren't really thinking about uh, the places that they're living in. You know, they, it's more like a sort of something that just uh, is done. 
and uh, they're not thinking about their surroundings, you know, uh, of, of the way these places exist within the city. It's just, you know, so a place where, where they live. And uh, this got me thinking over the years of, uh, that I'd like uh, the project to be seen by the people that I'm photographing their lives, you know, and, uh, and the places that they live in. Because uh, I think the, most of the places I've ever exhibited this work in were place, you know, art designated place, spaces. So these are places that aren't frequently uh, visited by the people that are living here. Of course, I'm doing a huge generalization here, but uh, for the sake of uh, our conversation, um, and um, let's say uh, the person, uh, Katie, if you could scroll to the person with uh, the plastic bag, the supermarket plastic bag and the baguette. I think it's the other direction. Yeah, it's the so, third image in. Yeah, so let's say Alex, Alexander, <laughs> with his full name. He's a person that uh, he used to take care of uh, an elderly couple that were living in the building, uh, my previous building. And I used to see him nearly on a daily basis. And, um, and this image was in an exhibition I, I did in 2007, I think, in the, the uh, Architectural House uh, Gallery in uh, Jaffa. And, um, and uh, I remember asking him and another two or three people that uh, I photographed uh, and were in that exhibition uh, that I'd like them to come and see the show. And they all were very interested, but none of them, they all answered me basically in the same idea that they couldn't take uh, even half a day off work to go and see it, even though I offered to drive them there and so on. And, um, and that got me also thinking, you know, of the fact that, um, that I'd really like to find a solution to show Southwest Jerusalem to the people of Southwest Jerusalem. And, uh, and later on in our conversation, we can talk more about that, uh, if you wish. I think, we, I think we do need to talk about that. And I think we, we need to move towards that um, really quickly here. But maybe we could just look at one more of the images from the series here then on the displacements.org website. Um, and Katie, if you wouldn't mind scrolling um, through towards the end, the third from last photograph here, which is of a a woman called Know Me. And maybe you could just uh, tell us a little bit about this image, likewise, Yakov, before we um, shift gears to talk about, you know, communicating more directly with these folks, as you've been indicating, um, uh, which is something that we definitely want to talk about what happened last week. So, okay, this is one of the, uh, well, this image came about in the, one of the most funny ways uh, uh, from, you know, when I think about this, this was really surreal. Um, I was occasionally, I, I, you know, my students ask me how it is to use an eight by 10 because most of the people I teach nowadays are using uh, DSLRs, you know, and uh, or mirrorless cameras. And the whole concept of, of going out of your way so much to make an image is something that uh, a lot of them really don't manage to, to understand why I'm doing this. And uh, so occasionally I, I on, you know, if we do a workshop or something like that, I sometimes take the camera with me just, you know, to demonstrate thing, uh, how, you know, how it's used for them. And uh, this was on one of those occasions and uh, the camera was up in front of this small sort of, this was a sort of kiosk at one stage or another. And I was explaining about, you know, how you can uh, correct uh, perspective and, uh, you know, and all these things. And uh, in my class, it's like, it was probably around 12 or something like, you know, 15 students were standing around me and I had my back to this, uh, to this place. And, uh, and, and at a certain point I noticed that none of them were actually looking at me. So I turned around and I saw this uh, lady that was sitting in front of the camera, just waiting to be photographed. So I said to him, listen, this is uh, uh, something that needs to be done. Please excuse me for 15 minutes or so. And uh, I'll be back. I'll be back to talking to you soon. And uh, so I just jumped over the fence. I talked to her for a second or two. I explained to her, you know, that uh, with with this type of camera, you really need not to move uh, for it to come out uh, okay. And uh, and she just sat there with her cigarette and her dog and this sort of goldish uh, bag. And uh, you know, just she was like uh, it was like posing like 
royalty posing. This was how I felt at the time. She, you know, she knew her role, and she knew my role, and uh, it was quite, you know, it was quite amazing. And uh, when I finished, I just thanked her, uh, and uh, she went her way, and I carried on teaching. And my students were completely shocked. Yeah, they just they said to me, "Listen, this was." You know, we, we've never seen something like this happen. And the camera has a sort of, um, the presence of the camera sometimes generates uh, these surreal moments. Uh, usually they're not as surreal as this one was, but, uh, but it certainly was very moving at the, you know, at the time. And when I see this, I, I can't not smile and remember uh, the, the same situation. This was also exhibited in Jerusalem in a group show. Uh, and. Uh, I often wondered if she ever sort of uh, bumped into into this image, um, uh, but I know that she doesn't usually doesn't move far from the neighborhood that she lives in. That was something she told me while we were sort of discussing, uh, you know, making the image. Yeah, anyway. I, th I think the word is uh, or the words are experiential learning. Those students are very lucky indeed. It's one thing to hear this is how you go about doing this, and then to to see it in action in such a fortuitous way is pretty grand. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're going to run out of time, unfortunately, but I do want to take just a few moments, Yakov, to talk about the business of giving back then or making this accessible to people. When you talk about uh, Alexander and how he couldn't make the time to come see um, himself in an exhibition in Jaffa. And that inevitably means talking about last Friday. And last Friday was a really big day, obviously, for uh, Southwest Jerusalem, not least because the displacements uh, exhibition opens, of course. And so um, it's visible now on the web and uh, at the college in important ways, but also you had a happening uh, in Jerusalem on Friday likewise. And so one of the, I guess, culminating moments for the entire project was um, that uh, business, I guess, of really reaching back out to the community. Um, this is very much about your home, not just because it's as intensely personal as we've been discussing, but because you live in this place and so you're encountering these people and the performance, which I think is probably a good word to use, um, uh, on Friday of giving out a newspaper that um, you were able to produce. And I'd love to have you talk about the business of producing the newspaper and how the newspaper works. Um, and maybe we can do that before we take uh, a moment at the end to look at a short video of what happened uh, in the neighborhoods and indeed around the gallery space in Jerusalem. So let me just frame this in terms of saying there's a, a parallel exhibition of Southwest Jerusalem, which is at uh, Black Box Gallery in downtown Jerusalem. And as part of that, Yakov was on the streets distributing a newspaper uh, which basically had essays and importantly the images to people in the neighborhoods. Yakov, tell us about that um, that happening. Well, um, about eight years ago, I started having you know uh, these thoughts about how how can I sort of expose the people of Southwest Jerusalem to uh, this series. Um, and um, one of the ideas I started that started materializing in my mind, that it uh, would be maybe the best solution would be to make a newspaper, uh, including these images and including texts uh, uh, of a variety, um, a variety from uh, you know texts that uh, let's say we've got at the moment we've got uh, in this newspaper that did materialize two texts that are more of an academic sort of uh, approach. And then we've got uh, another one that's uh, more of a philosophical approach. And then we've got uh, an essay that I wrote about growing up in this, uh, in uh, Kirat Eva neighborhood and a short story, uh, you know, and so we've got like a very large variety of, of texts within the newspaper from this idea that, um, you know, to sort of, uh, this, this really materialized for me standing uh, uh, outside and making these images of these buildings and then people coming out of the building itself and looking at their building for what felt to me the first time. And that sort of got me to think that, you know, they're not, they, they, they live, in, I've already said this here, but you know, that they're living in this building for maybe decades and haven't really looked at it. And this got me to think about the fact that they might not be also thinking, you know, of how they're living in the space as a community, you know, as, uh, as part of the city. And, um, and I thought that, you know, to, to create something that maybe, hopefully, um, 
allows has the possibility anyway to to allow you know all kinds of people to connect to it in various ways you know so some might want you know might have an interest in text at a more of an academic approach some might you know something that's more connected to fiction and maybe something in between and um, and this uh, idea you know something I you, you know for sure because we've been talking about this over the years that we we're collaborating uh, took a long time to materialize because uh, we had to find funding but um, uh, half a year ago we opened an exhibition uh, in uh, 97 Jaffa Street gallery it's an outdoor gallery that's run by uh, a group uh, called Black Box and um, and Asaf and Yitzhak uh, the curators of the gallery invited you to be a co-curator uh, together with them or guest curator and uh, together uh, the three of you curated a show of Southwest Jerusalem in an outdoor gallery and when I say outdoor gallery it's like uh, it's uh, five double-sided uh, light panels uh, quite large um, and um, these panels are uh, you know they they situated uh, uh, in the center of Jerusalem uh, on uh, very you know if you leave if you go out of the uh, light train uh, you you actually find yourself in front of them in uh, you know the center of Jerusalem and uh, that was the first stage of uh, of me trying to expose you know to exhibit the the series to the people of these neighborhoods uh, because many of the of the people use the public transportation you know to to uh, get to the center of Jerusalem so this was the, like the idea of showing this work specifically in this gallery and um, and uh, when we started talking about the exhibition uh, Black Box and myself we, I said to them you know I've got another idea and maybe you guys are gonna roll with it <laughs> you know, if you know and uh, I told them about the newspaper and uh, I've been trying to get this, uh, you know, get funding for this and collaborating on this aspect uh, with quite a few people. But they really, they liked the idea and they said, let's see how we can do it. And it's, you know, like every project that started growing. And uh, at the end, uh, they managed to get the municipality of Jerusalem to fund a bit and, uh, and also the Israeli lottery uh, system also to, to, to fund the rest. And we printed uh, 5,000 copies of the newspaper. Um, and uh, one of the people that wrote text there is, of course, you. Uh, and uh, and Chaim Yaakovi and Shelley Cohen wrote the text. Uh, they the you know uh, they uh, wrote about the architecture from uh, you know in Jerusalem specifically, but in Israel, this type of architecture. And uh, Gidon Lev, uh, who is a, a philosopher wrote a text about the uh, love and the apartment block and Yamit Nataf, uh, which is a young uh, writer also living in Jerusalem, uh, uh, wrote a short story uh, that was inspired by the, you know, inspired by these images, uh, which, which is also quite amazing because she was inspired uh, without uh, even knowing my idea of making a newspaper. Uh, it happened just by chance. And all these texts uh, came together uh, and with a lot of images from uh, uh, from this series, it was designed by an amazing designer called Nino, Nino Beniashvili, uh, which I've uh, already worked with uh, in the past. And uh, and uh, on Friday, uh, we we also printed out uh, overalls and uh, hats. And uh, and on Friday, me and uh, a few amazing ex students of mine that volunteered uh, spontaneously to uh, um, distribute uh, the newspaper together with me. We opened sort of store, uh, sort of uh, stalls in the neighborhoods, in the commercial centers, and uh, we gave out the newspaper to the residents. And it was quite an experience uh, um, because I was sure that people just, you know, there's some, there's a newspaper for free that people just pick it up and uh, take it home. But uh, it turns out that people don't take things, uh, you know, just uh, even if they are free so quickly. And uh, I found myself explaining nearly to all the people that I was giving out newspapers to what the newspaper was about. And uh, 
small amount of them just said after that, no, no, this isn't for us. We're looking for, you know, the extreme right-wing uh, newspaper that's given out for free that, uh, that uh, usually uh, occupies a space nearby where I was standing. And, uh, but uh, a lot of them, uh, it was really amazing to see the, the way they reacted. You know, some people just uh, thanked me for, for, you know, taking the time to do a project on them, you know, and the neighborhood. Some people that uh, I really nearly forced them to take a copy uh, came back after 15 minutes uh, saying that it's really interesting and they're happy they took it. And it was really, it was quite an experience, you know, so eight hours I was standing there in the sun uh, explaining to people about the project and the newspaper. And we managed to distribute uh, all in all, uh, also in the neighbors, but also with uh, lo uh, local uh, newspapers in Jerusalem, uh, about 4,000 copies. Um, the first performance of my life. Well, and a good one. And I think maybe we can end on that short video clip and then we'll have some time for questions because otherwise we really are going to run long. I'm reminded in looking at that video um, uh, when seeing everybody wearing masks about this damn COVID and draws a line under the fact that I should have been there myself on Friday last trying to put that newspaper in people's hands. But um, it really was uh, a fabulous um, and maybe not the culmination, but a culminating moment that strikes me for the entirety of the project, Yakov, in terms of just putting it back in people's hands and acknowledging the residents and the, and the place. Uh, quite wonderful performance, it looks like to me in any event. I do think we have time for questions. Yeah, maybe I'll just say that uh, Mark was uh, greatly missed here because uh, the initial idea was uh, to, to do all this, uh, um, you know, like in May and uh, because of the COVID, nobody actually saw the exhibition for the first three months because nobody was walking the streets. So uh, Black Box decided to leave it up for another three months. And, uh, and Mark was supposed to be in Jerusalem wearing one of these blue overalls with me and one of these hats and uh, handing out uh, newspapers. And uh, that uh, sadly didn't happen. You were greatly missed, Mark. <laughs> Katie. Well, I'm, um, thank you so much for, for sharing that, that video with us. And I also, I'm glad that the exhibition is now able to be extended and people are being able to experience it. And I too am sad not to see Mark Long in the blue, in the blue <laughs> overall, so maybe in another iteration. <laughs> um, I did have some, I wanna encourage anybody watching to please um, feel free to ask any questions in the Facebook comments and I can see them and relay them to this pair. Um, but I also have some questions as a viewer of, of your conversation. And you know, you two, obviously you have a relationship, a, a long working relationship over many years now. I think that's apparent to, to anybody watching um, and for people watching, you know, they've, Mark and Yaakov have worked together beyond this uh, current project of Southwest Jerusalem and displacements. They've, they've worked together a few times over the years. So I'm curious, you know, you're, you're very familiar with each other's work and, and what Yaakov, you're familiar with Mark's writing on your work. He's written an essay for your work previously, your exhibition at the Hall of the Institute in 2014. But I'm curious, you know, if in reading Mark's 
words or his response to your work, does, does that, um, do you see anything new in your work after reading Mark's writing about it? Well, uh, of course, and uh, but it's uh, usually, you know, earlier than seeing the final text because, uh, uh, well, let's start from the fact that uh, the exhibition of the quest for the man on the white donkey uh, uh, at the Halsey was really, you know, really pre uh, pleasurable um, moment in, you know, in my career, I think. And uh, the f uh, also, let's, let's not forget uh, Mark Sloan that initiated this and also curated the show. And uh, Mark, uh, uh, the minute he decided to actually exhibit the work, he said, listen, you know, uh, I'd like uh, one of our uh, uh, curators to write about it and not use the text that, you, that have already been written about the work. And uh, this is always like a sort of dodgy moment because uh, um, being Israeli, sometimes, you know, the, the writers that uh, are assigned to write about the work might sort of look at aspects that aren't so favorable and not at the work itself. And uh, he said, listen, I think you're going to like Mark. And uh, this is how it started. And uh, Mark wrote an amazing text that till today, I'm sad it's not in the book. The book was published uh, way before we, uh, we met. And, um, and when I arrived in Charleston, um, um, me and Mark uh, sort of, you know, uh, became friends and uh, we talked a lot. And uh, I also talked in a few of his classes and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I didn't really think that we'd managed to keep a, you know, f uh, professional friendship uh, and friendship going, but um, because, you know, we, I met many amazing people throughout the last 20 years. Uh, on occasions similar to this, but uh, but uh, somehow somehow we did manage to keep this going. Hey? And I think uh, that uh, this happened because Mark really has um, Mark. I can can I tell a few secrets, Mark? <laughs> so Mark, part of his career is uh, he's a curator that and he specializes uh, in photography, but also he's a political geographer. And I think that this combination uh, uh, really relates well to the type of work I'm interested in doing. And our conversations um, are usually much more about uh, issues that, uh, that we are experiencing. And, uh, and then at the end, uh, about the images and the way these images uh, you know, uh, demonstrate or, or show or, or you know, or have clues within them towards uh, th these kind of understandings. And, uh, but that's not the only text Mark wrote for, for that accompanied my work. Uh, in 2015, I published my second book. It's called Legitimacy of Landscape. And Mark uh, was kind enough to write uh, the essay for that uh, uh, book. And uh, the reason I asked him at the time was that I wanted somebody that was genuinely interested in, uh, in the work and not just assigned to do it. And uh, it, it was really an amazing uh, text. And, uh, and after that, when I had the opportunity to exhibit the work in the, the, the Museum of Islamic Art here in Jerusalem, uh, I asked uh, the director of the museum if we could invite Mark to curate the show. So um, opportunities have ari arisen sort of that we could sort of, you know, carry on bouncing our ideas uh, from one to the other uh, throughout uh, our professional, you know, practice. And, uh, and also Mark has been a huge part of uh, also the exhibition now of Southwest Jerusalem at, you know, at the 97 uh, Jaffa Street Gallery. And also uh, the newspaper, Mark is, you know, the co-editor of the newspaper together with me. And uh, I can't even start talking about the amount of energy and uh, insight, uh, you know, from every small idea to big that Mark has contributed to to this newspaper. So I'm forever grateful, you know, for for this uh, for Mark Sloan introducing me to Mark Long <laughs> at the in 2014. Thanks, Jacob. You're too kind. That <laughs> that's a that's a long answer to the question, but um, and I appreciate those words. Uh, you're very kind indeed. Um, I, I do want to draw a line under how how um, fa fascinating and fabulous um, the various projects are. And you know, um, 
one thing that we won't have time to talk about is the kind of compendium of what Yakov is, is accomplishing. I'm, I'm hesitant to say has accomplished, is accomplishing in terms of not only the Southwest Jerusalem project shining a light on kind of overlooked places and overlooked people um, in that particular city, but indeed the so-called Arab villages, which was the subject matter for that a legitimacy of landscape project, um, people on the margins across um, the Israeli territory. I mean, really what we're seeing emerge here is a kind of a people's geography of uh, Israel through the eyes of, um, you know, one of the most important voices in photography in Israel for sure. So. Um, uh, thanks for your kind words, Yakov. I wish we had more time to talk about more of those projects. I, I have a question. I count, that actually... I, sorry, Katie. I count myself lucky that you want to collaborate with me so, so many years, Mark. <laughs> this is a two. Okay. Yes, Katie. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, no. You, you, cert you two certainly, you can tell, have a very a great rapport and a, a great, so many things have come out of your relationship. But going off of that question, Mark started to touch on some of the other communities or communities of people moving into Southwest Jerusalem. And um, I received a question that said, many of the scenes captured in this series are located on streets named after other countries. Are these street names connected to the immigrant populations in the community? From what I know not, I think it's connected to all kinds of, uh, you know, relations that uh, the state started to establish at the time. You know, this is not that, you know, it's like, uh, not that many years after the state of Israel was established, and I think that's more connected to to that aspect, you know, uh, political relationships that uh, started materializing. But I must say I don't have the correct answer, you know, the the real answer for that one. Uh, it's just something I lived with uh, all my life. <laughs> it is a bit bizarre. And you know, let me let me say as a political geographer that that's a really really dynamite question. There's a there's a really neat master's thesis for somebody, um, or maybe even a PhD, unearthing the naming of those particular cities. The excuse me, the naming of those particular um, uh, streets in the city for specific countries and indeed even places. Um, and somebody's probably doing that work. You know, there's a, a long tradition of top on him studies, but Israel's a fascinating place from the perspective of political geography on so many different levels that um, you know, we need to turn somebody on to that proposition, that research project, if they're not doing it already. I must say that from all the reading I've ever you know, done throughout the years on these places, th this has never popped up. So I wonder if there is something on the web, uh, you know, or elsewhere. I'm sure elsewhere, yes, on the web, I'm not 100% sure yet, but I'll look at the, I should look that one up. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're we're getting we're getting ideas for new projects here. I was gonna say I look forward to seeing your names pop up in the acknowledgments of a dissertation or a new article forthcoming, co-authored by the two of you on this on this <laughs> subject. <laughs> um, Marcus, uh, you, uh, Katie's pitching it to you. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. There's so many other things um, that, that we could explore, um, but um, I think it's a uh, time that we, we wrap up our, our conversation here. Um, thank you so much. We, we had a comment um, from Euphis Ruth on the Facebook, who is uh, one of our a Southbound artists who also works in a non-traditional, with a non-traditional camera using wet plate colloidian. And uh, he really enjoyed that image, uh, the story about the image of Naomi and said he looks forward to checking out more of your work. So maybe a, another person to draw in on that photography, <laughs> on that forthcoming photography project. But thank you both so much. Um, thank you everyone for, for, for tuning in. Um, again, this was the conversation between Yaakov Israel and Mark Long in conjunction with the Displacements Revisitations of Home exhibition. This video, if you, if you missed it, um, will live on on Facebook, but also will be archived on the project website, which is displacements.org. So look for that to appear uh, in, the coming, in the coming week. And thank you so much, Yaakov, joining us across space and time from Jerusalem, and uh, Mark Long joining us just across the way uh, here in Charleston. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.